Amen. Keep a bookmark in Revelation chapter 2 and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 5 for just a minute. So this evening, we're starting a new sermon series um, talking about um, Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. And uh, Jesus, if you have a red letter Bible, these words will all be read. This is Jesus giving advice um, to seven different churches. And the church in Ephesus is the one that we're going to start with this evening. But why um, should we study through this? Um, what relevance does it have um, to us? Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and look down at verse number 22, where the Bible says this. This is used many times in weddings and marriage um, counseling and marriage advice and, and just the roles of husbands and wives. Ephesians chapter 5 is a very important um, chapter in the Bible for uh, marital relations. But look at verse 22. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So all that to say this, um, Jesus Christ here in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 is giving advice to the churches, and Jesus is the head of the church. So this is something that we should pay attention to. So basically, what we have in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is the boss giving instruction is what we have. So we need to pay attention to the details of what he's talking about um, to these churches. So we're going to look at the church in Ephesus, which is basically Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 this evening, and see what we can glean from um, Jesus' advice to this first church that he is talking about. Look at verse, um, starting in verse number 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He's talking, he's saying here to the angel, he's say, saying, you know, to the messenger that's going to bring this message to the church, he's telling um, John that he wants this message delivered to these churches. Look at verse number two, talking about Ephesus. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how that thou canst not bear them, which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne and has patience, and for mine sake, my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. So he says a lot of good things um, here about the church of Ephesus, but then in verse number four, um, he goes into um, some things that he has problems. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence... Thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicol Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So Jesus starts out, and he gives this whole, that's all the advice that he gives to the church at Ephesus. But he starts out with some good things, and he says a couple of things twice. In verse number 3, in verse number 4, in verse number 2, in verse number 3, he starts out with some good things about the church at Ephesus. And he says he commends them on their labor twice, on how hard um, they work. So look, these people, these people are, are hardworking. You know, they have some staying power. They didn't quit. It says, it says in verse 3, it says, that they've labored and they have not fainted. So they've worked and worked and worked, and they've not fainted. Another thing that Jesus commends the church of Ephesus about in verse number 2, it says they would not stand for people in their church that were teaching false doctrine. So this is something that Jesus commends them about, and what we can take from this is this is something good that we should not allow in the churches. He says, thou hast tried them. You know, you've tried them again. How did they try them? They tried them against the word of God, against what they were saying, and found that they were not apostles. Instead, they were liars. And then down in verse, um, I'm sorry, in verse number six, it says, also again in this same uh, tack, it says, but thou hast, thou hast hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So the Nicolaitans, the Bible, the New Testament, doesn't really tell us what this doctrine is. You can go out and you can read all kinds of, commentary on it, but it's irrelevant. 
All we need to know is that God hates whatever they were teaching. So the Nicolaitans were teaching something that God hates, and the nice thing about the Ephesians that Jesus commends them on is that they hated the same things that Jesus hated. They hated the same doctrine that Jesus hated. And that's a good um, example for us, is that we need to hate the things that the Lord hates. That's what the Bible would call a perfect hatred right there. So look, I mean, the, you know, the funny thing is about, you know, this isn't a sermon about what we should hate and what we should love, but the funny thing is, is all those people today that are telling you you should hate nothing, it's, it, those are the most wicked people that you could ever find. Because people that are out there saying you should hate nothing, they don't want you to hate them because they're teaching evil, wicked things. So the only thing we need to know about the Nicolaitans is that they were teaching doctrine that the Lord hated, and the, the church in Ephesus they hated that as well. So Jesus commends them for that. So he, he commends them for their labor and their patience. And I'm going to talk about their patience a little bit later. But then he commends them for not tolerating false doctrine. There's a lot of good things here that the church at Ephesus has um, on their side. So the question is, you know, I mean, this, this, we can't have this anything goes church. That's what, that's what um, we're learning here from the church at Ephesus. So the question is, then Jesus comes into verse number four, and he says, I have something. He's like, all that being said, he's like, there's some problems here. He's like, you know, he's kind of a, he's kind of a you know, the, uh, this, these management styles where if you have to deliver bad news to somebody, you're supposed to sandwich it in. You know, you're supposed to, like, give them some good news. And then it's like, hey, Bob, you're great, um, Bob. Um, but the thing is, you're fired, Bob. And the thing is, Bob, your family's really nice. You make it a sandwich like that, right? So, I mean, I'm being extreme. But the point is, is Jesus is giving some good news, but then he says, nevertheless, there's some problems. And look at verse number four. So there is some bad things here. Verse number four. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left, left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. So it's kind of a serious problem that they have here. I mean, Jesus kind of makes it, you know, he kind of lightens the blow a little bit. But when we see that the consequences, if they don't get this right, is Jesus is literally going to take the candlestick away from their church. He's literally going to remove his hand from their church. They're not going to be a legitimate church anymore. He's saying, you know, you get this right or you're on your own and you're just running one of these other worldly churches that just call themselves a church but aren't a church. Okay, so the problem is listed in verse number four where it says that thou have left thy first love. So the problem here is, is that they lost the love for the first works. In short, these people, they were out there and they were still laboring and they were, they were still doing a lot of the things that they were supposed to be doing. They were going through the motions, so to speak, but they lost their zeal is what happened to this church. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. In verse number one, look at Ephesians chapter two in verse number one. Look at, and, and I'm going to read for you verse number five one more time, where Jesus says to them, he says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. He says, remember where you used to be. Remember where you came from. Remember how you used to operate. And he says, go back to that, repent. Turn back to the way that you used to be, is what Jesus is saying. Well, how did they used to be? Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Paul here is saying, you know, basically, you know, where they used to be. He kind of answers this for us in his letter to the Ephesians. And it says, and you, he hath quickened. He's talking to the church at Ephesus. Who were dead in trespass and sins, where in time past. So these people in, in time past... You walked according to the course of this world. So these people in the past, they're not there now. It's like now they're walking according to the spirit, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He's saying, look, you used to be these worldly people. He says, among whom also 
We all had our conversations, again, in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who in his rich mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. So he's saying, he's like, look, he's talking about, you know, where these people came from. And he's like, then you got saved and you were quickened, you know, by, by Christ. And he's, he's saying, look, he's like, we need to go back. This is what Jesus is saying. They need to go back to that love when they were first born again. When they were first, you know, when they were first brought and quickened by Christ is what Jesus is talking about in Revelation chapter 2. But somehow, these people in Ephesus, they're laboring, and somehow they just lost this love. They lost this zeal. And they were just going through the motions. So this evening, I want to look at how this can happen. How can this happen? Because look, this is in the Bible. This is in the Bible because this is not just relevant for the church at Ephesus. This is relevant for all of us. That's the beauty of the Bible. The Bible is the only book ever written that applies to everyone. And this one, specifically, talking about a church that Jesus Christ is ahead of, is specifically applicable to us. So look, how can we lose our zeal as the church at Ephesus had lost their zeal, and what can we do about it? So the first thing is, you know, here's the process. Here's what happens. You know, you get saved. Right? Somebody tells you the truth. Maybe you were seeking the truth. You obviously had a desire within you to want to know the truth. Your conscience is looking for the truth. Somebody preaches the gospel to you. You get saved. At that point, you know, hopefully, I mean, everyone here for sure, but hopefully you at that point get into a good church at some point and want to live a profitable, fruitful life where you can learn the Bible, start living the Bible, and, and then guess what? You get into these, these first works. And I'll talk about that in detail in a little bit. But then what happens is what happens to the church at Ephesus. Look, you get into the first works. You start laboring. You have some patience. You're, you're laboring for the Lord. But then zeal is lost. It's just like the church at Ephesus, zeal gets lost. So how do we lose zeal in our lives? Why? Why does it happen? And I mean, I'm gonna, the first thing I'm going to show you, I'm just going to give you some thoughts on why we lose zeal, not just for the Lord in our lives, but for pretty much everything in our lives, we lose zeal. And some people are worse than others, but I'm going to give you some, some points tonight that hopefully you can recognize that when this is happening and you can stop it before it gets too serious because it can cost you a lot in your life if you lose zeal, you don't recognize it, and you begin living your life uh, you know, you're beginning living a life uh, without zeal. Not just for the Lord, but just for things in your life, things, people in your life. So the first thing that we do in our lives as, as people, as human beings, is we take things for granted in our lives. We, we just, you know, we just get used to things. As, as people, as human beings, we get used to things. And look, why is this? Why do we just get used to things? We, we lose a, what I like to look, we lose our reference point. We find th something that we always wanted, and we get that thing, and then we get used to that thing, and we take that thing for granted, and then all of a sudden, we lose our zeal for whatever that thing is. We lose our reference point. To try to understand this and how we can fix this and stop this from happening, let's look at a few things in the life of Paul. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look, Paul was somebody who was very, very good at not allowing this to happen in his life. He is, a, he is probably the best example of someone in the Bible that protected his zeal in the Bible. So let's look at what we can learn um, from Paul. So look, this is why, by the way, this is why, you know, struggle is good in your life. This is why hard times are good in your life. Because as you go through your life and you, and you lose, you know, th those are reference points. When you have financial struggles in your life, those are reference points. When you have struggles maybe in your marriage, those are reference points for you. All these hard times that you go through, if you have physical problems in your life, or you have a family member that has physical problems in your life, 
Those are reference points for you. Reference points that you can always look back to, and that can stop you from taking things for granted in your life. That can stop you from losing zeal for things in your life. Let's look at Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's try to understand um, what I'm talking about tonight um, from the life of Paul. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and look at verse number 7. Look what the Bible says here. It says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul here is saying, he's like, and Kate, you know, he's like, look, first of all, he's saying, I don't want to glory in these things. He's like, because look, would it be hard to be exalted? Would it be hard to glory in the fact that Jesus Christ came and taught you something personally? If Jesus Christ showed up to somebody in this church and taught you something personally and spent years with you, just preparing you for a special mission in your life, don't you think that that could go to your head? And Paul here is saying, he's like, In, unless that would happen to me, that I would start to be exalt myself more than I should. He's like, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. It was some kind of physical issue that Paul had. And for this thing, it, look, it was something that was so, you know, distressing to him that he asked the Lord three times to fix it. He said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. He's like, Lord, just take this away from me. Take this, you know, this pain or whatever I'm having away from me. Look at verse number nine. And he said unto me, and this is Jesus responding, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, Jesus here is saying that's kind of a nice little statement. He's saying, no, he, he, the answer was no. I mean, when you pray, the, if you pray and it's just it's not happening, it's not, look, the answer just may have been no in your life. You know, I mean, God says no. And I mean, he says no for our own benefit when we don't even think that we should be, you know, we're probably not even asking the right things most times. But Jesus says, my strength, like Jesus says, my strength. The Lord says, my strength, the Lord's strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity. So this is nice, right? I mean, God has proven right in like two verses here. So Paul's saying, I don't want to be exalted. I don't want to glory in my knowledge, in my revelation from the Lord. He's like, instead, I will glory in my pain and suffering. Like, you're like, wow, that sounds weird. But look, that's what he says that the power of Christ may rest upon me. If he says, if that's what it takes to stay in the grace and stay in this position that God has put me in, that, you know, I'll just glory in my infirmities. That's where Paul will, you know, boast, so to speak. That will be his boasting and just in his infirmities. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Am I become a fool in glorying? Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. So yes, God is keeping him humble here, but God is, you know, Paul had a lot of pain and suffering in his life. Talk about a guy who never had a chance to be comfortable. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He never had a chance to just be comfortable and enjoy things. He never had a chance to take things for granted in his life. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and look at verse 23. This is Paul glorying again in these infirmities. Look at verse 23, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in, pres in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils by the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, in cold, in nakedness. 
Look, it sounds kind of like he's, he's, uh, you know, he's glorying in this a little bit. But this is what he gloried in. Besides those things that are without, that which come upon me daily, the care of all the churches. He's like, plus, you know, I'm just worried about everybody. Who is weak and am I not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. He's like, if I'm going to get lifted up, if I'm going to be exalted, I will be exalted in these things that the Lord is using to keep me low. <laughs> it's what he's saying. And Paul, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. He's basically saying the only thing that the Lord wants me boasting or glorying in is my suffering. Paul had the ultimate reference point in his life. He had the ultimate reference points. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And you know what that produced? You know what that produced with Paul? So he had these great reference points. He had all these hard times and all this suffering in his life. And you know what that produced? You will find, I don't think you will find anybody in the Bible who was more thankful than Paul. And if you remember, maybe you read past this real quickly in every single epistle that Paul writes, but nearly every epistle that he writes to churches, Paul says things like this, Wherefore I also, look at verse 15 of Ephesians 1, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you. In Romans 1.8, he just gives thanks for the Roman church. In 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 4, he gives thanks to them. At Corinth, in Colossians 1, he gives thanks to them. In verse 13, I mean, or verse number 3, he starts out every letter saying, saying, look, I'm so thankful for you. Even before he starts yelling at them and just rebuking them and exhorting them, he says, but look, he's like, I am so thankful thankful for you. Paul was very thankful. And that is the opposite of being ungrateful. That is the opposite of taking things for granted. So what God did by keeping Paul in all those infirmities, in all that suffering, was he kept him thankful in his life. And let me just point this out because it seems like something that is, that is, that is minor, to us, but it is not. Look, there is a reason in Romans 121. There is a reason in one of the most serious books of the Bible, in Romans chapter 1, that the, it says, neither were they thankful, was one of the first steps that those people that ended up being rejected by the Lord took. They, were, they knew God, but they were not thankful for God. So look, being thankful is something that is extremely important in your life. Do you know that unthankfulness in general in your life, not just unthankfulness to the Lord, but in th unthankfulness in your life is an extremely dangerous place to be. And it's, look, it's an equation. It's an equation that has to do, I wish I could graph it for you, but it's an equation that has to do with how long you're unthankful. Because if you live a life, look, there's a T in there. If you take unthankfulness times time, it gets more serious the longer you are unthankful. Because guess what? Guess what? If you go through life and you are unthankful in your life for long periods of time, you will start making decisions on that unthankfulness. And those decisions will be disastrous. Imagine making relationship decisions based on the fact that you're unthankful. It will cause major problems in your life. I've seen major issues in people's life because of this. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. With people, with relationships. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse number 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Look, that doesn't just say for the Bible. That says in everything that God, look, everything you have is a gift from God. Everything that you have from your, your spouse to your life 
to all the good things that, that are in your life, all those things are gifts from God. And the Bible says that you should be thankful in everything. Everything. And if you start living this life where you're not thankful for things, and you, look, and you start making decisions in that state of mind, look, not appreciating what you have, I mean, there's people out there that live their lives and they only become thankful for things after they've lost the things that they took for granted. That's a disastrous life right there. That is the type of person you do not want to operate as. Every single marriage problem, here's a statement for you, every single marriage problem starts with unthankfulness. Think about that. It starts for, because guess what? You know what? I come home from work every single day. Look, I'm not immune to this. I come home from work every single day, and guess what? She's there. I come home at noon. She's there. I come home all the time. I wake up. She's there. She's not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. Guess what? You get used to that. He's not going anywhere. You start thinking that way. And guess what? You just get used to it. You get used to each other. And you just... Yeah, guess what? Guess what, folks? Every single husband and every single wife in this room, he will not always be there. She will not always be there. You say, what? My wife's going to leave me. My husband's going to leave No. You will, you will wake up one day, and your wife will not be there. Guaranteed. Or, the other way around, you will wake up one day, 100%, folks, and your husband will not be there. You need to have that reference point. Remember, you know, remember that reference point when you first got married and you were so thankful to be married and then you're married for 10 years, 20 years, 25 years. I'm not there yet. But look, you need to appreciate people in your life. You need to appreciate your spouse. Every single marriage problem starts from one or the other or both. Taking each other for granted, not being thankful for one another. Think of Solomon. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Look, the Bible says, I mean, the Bible says in Revelation 2, it's like they lost their love. That's what happened. They lost their love. It says, nevertheless, I have someone against you. You, you left your first love. They left their love. They stopped loving that. They, they started taking that for granted. They lost that zeal. That can happen in your marriage. You can lose the zeal for the people in your life. You can lose the zeal for your children. You can lose the zeal for your friends. You can lose the zeal for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Every single relationship you have with a human being, you can lose the zeal for that, and you do it by taking it for granted. You do it by getting used to it. Things that are always there, you get used to. you got to stop doing that. you got to have reference points in your life. Look at Solomon. Think about Solomon's wife and then all his wives. You can be so unthankful for your wife, your spouse, and live that life of unthankfulness and then make decisions in your life. Imagine making decisions out of unthankfulness. Look, this ruins marriages. There, there is, there's been husbands that have decided to leave their wives and wives that have decided to leave their husbands out of unthankfulness. You say, oh, it was something else. It started with unthankfulness. It started because they, they took each other for granted and they got used to each other and they lost that zeal for one another. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 28. Which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Look, he lost his zeal for his first wife by taking her for granted, living in that unthankfulness with his first wife, and then going and having all these other wives and concubines. That's what Solomon had. I mean, look, do not take the relationships in your life for granted. You should not have to get to the point where you lose things in your life before you are thankful for them. That is, look, that is a serious character flaw. That is a serious character flaw that will define your entire life. It will define your marriage. It will define how you raise your children. It will define, you know, it will define how your children think of you. If you are the type of person that needs to lose things before you then become thankful for those things, look, and it, it could even go further than that. You could be so unthankful for things 
and then lose those things and then be bitter that you lost those things. It would be better to be the type of person that lost those things and then was again thankful for those things. But look, you just don't ever want to be thankful and lose the things in the first place. You don't want to lose your zeal for the Lord. You don't want to lose your marriage. You don't want to do any of these things. You don't want to lose anything in your life because of unthankfulness. It's, it's a terrible thing to do. Family, church, the Lord. Look, appreciate this church. Never get used to it. I know that's a hard thing. You come here three times a week. How do you not get used to this? But you're going to get used to it. You're going to get used to it. You're going to take it for granted. I mean, think about soul winning. I mean, soul winning is fun, but sometimes it feels like labor. I mean, you labor in soul winning. But look, that's what happened to the church at Ephesus. They lost their zeal for it. They were still laboring, but they lost their zeal for it. Turn to Matthew 22. And Jesus said to get their zeal back, he's like, do the first work. So what is, what is that? He says, do the first works. So look, the first point is this. You lose your zeal by taking things for granted and becoming unthankful in your life. That's how you'll lose zeal for anything that you should have zeal for. I hope that you have zeal for your marriage. I hope that you remind yourself constantly that you should have zeal for your marriage. Guess what? You should all do this mental exercise every now and then. What if she wasn't there tomorrow? And then maybe that'll give you a little bit more zeal for your wife. Wives, you should think about what if he's gone tomorrow? Would I feel differently about him today? Guess what? You're not guaranteed a husband for another day. You're not guaranteed anything. We think that we're guaranteed these things, folks. You're not guaranteed a wife for another day. I'm so thankful that I have a wife, but I guarantee, I'm telling you, I don't appreciate it like I should. I mean, I should show my wife my zeal for her more than I do. And every single spouse, every single husband and wife in this room should say the same thing. Because guess what? Just imagine. Here's your reference point. Imagine they're not there tomorrow. There's your reference point for your marriage. But Jesus says to the church, so don't be unthankful. Remember those reference points. Paul had the perfect reference points. A life of nothing but suffering and hardship. Look at Matthew 22. Look at verse 36. Master, which is the greatest com great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart and all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself. Jesus basically, he lays out right there. He's like, love the Lord your God. That's the first great commandment. And the second one, he's like, love your neighbor as yourself. He's like, every single thing is underneath those two umbrellas. Every commandment in the Bible is underneath those two umbrellas. Love the Lord and serve your neighbor is basically what it's about. Anything getting in, I mean, and from there, you know, I mean, how do you do that? Well, I don't know. You love the Lord by loving his word, by loving Jesus Christ. He is the word. And, you know, preach the gospel. Go ye therefore and preach the, go ye therefore into all the, you know, and preach the gospel to every creature. That is how you love the Lord and serve your neighbor. That's why we call these things the first works. I mean, if you love me, obey my commandments. So those, that is the remedy. That is the, that's the medicine that Jesus gave this church to get their zeal back. Look, you need to remember those reference points. If you say, oh, I'm losing, I'm losing my zeal for spiritual things. I'm losing my zeal. I'm laboring. I'm going out, but I'm losing my zeal. So many doesn't seem like it was. Remember, get a reference point. I remember, I remember the first time, the first time that I heard somebody effectively get someone saved, effectively preach the gospel to somebody was in 2016, and I was standing next to, we had come here to visit, and I got sent out the very first time I got sent out by Verity Baptist Church to go soul winning. I was partnered with Pastor Logan Robinson. From, I think, you know, he was from Australia, now he's in the Philippines. I haven't heard where he's at now, but um, in the, he was in the Philippines last time I, I knew. But I saw him at like the second door that we knocked, I saw him lead someone to the Lord. And I'll never forget that. And I remember thinking at that point, I remember thinking at that point in my life, I'd be like, man, I would love to be able to get one person saved in my life. I remember thinking that. 
And I mean, I, I went out and then I was a silent partner. I was a silent partner for a long time because I didn't want to mess it up. So I was a silent, silent partner for a couple months, maybe longer. And then when I went out, I would go out with Brother Oliver, Brother Stucky, and just be like, you guys tell me when I'm, if I'm messing anything up, I want to be good at this. Right? And I, well, I'm sure I wasn't good at it at first. But the point is, my reference point was I wanted to go out and I wanted to do what he did. I wanted to get just one person saved in my life. Look, that's the kind of zeal that I always want to remember. We can go out and we can labor. Look, I mean, soul winning, soul winning should be fun. I mean, soul winning is fun. You get to go out and meet all kinds of people, Scooby-Doo or whoever, you know. I mean, you get to meet all kinds of people out there, and they're, they're different people. And there's, look, there's people, you know, but we also met, you know, when we met Scooby-Doo, we met somebody that actually needed some help, that actually was having problems in their life, talking about maybe they didn't want to live anymore and all these types of things. Look, this is a big deal that we're out there. And we're making differences in people's lives. And somebody told Brother Matt today, this was like the greatest day of my life. She told him. She's like, this, I, I can't remember the exact words, but it was something along the lines of this is the greatest day of my life, or this is like the best thing that's ever happened to me. And we're like, exactly. But guess what? We're part of that. I mean, don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget the importance of what we're doing. I mean, Sometimes I get it. Sometimes you just got to labor. You just got to push things, push through things. You know, look, there's nothing wrong with faking it until you make it. All right, there's nothing wrong with, you know what, I just don't feel good today, and I don't really feel like being here today, and just faking it until you make it. But look, if you're just constantly have no zeal anymore, there's something wrong there. There's something wrong that needs to be fixed. There. So, I mean, this is another problem. So just remember these reference points. Remember, find that time in your life when you had that zeal and always remember that and don't lose that. Be thankful for the fact that you can be part of people's lives. Be thankful for the fact that you all have been, have been look, this is your destiny. You have been predestined. You have been predestined to go out and share the most important message that anyone has ever had ever for anyone. I mean, that's pretty important. Don't ever take that for granted. Remember a reference point in your life to keep that zeal. You know, hopefully, you know, this is another thing with young people as far as Paul and, and the suffering that Paul went through. This is another problem that, that young people, and no offense to the young people in the room, but young people are generally going to take things for granted easier than older people. Because why? Because they don't have a lot of hard times. They don't have a lot of those reference points in their lives. That's why, you know, it's, it, it's important that they find their own reference points. It's, it, it, you know, and, and look, young people, when you do go through hard times in your life, when you do have some suffering in your life, whether that be, you know, physical or financial or whatever, look, use those. Those are valuable times. Those are valuable reference points for you. Turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. I mean, look, I mean, you know, We've had some hard times, and I've, had some, I've got some reference points in my life. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there's many, many people in the world that have had way more reference points than me. But look, I don't, I don't want to be the kind of person either that God has to, like, give hard times to to give me more reference points. I want to take the reference points that God has given me, and I want to, I want to learn from those and, and use those going forward. Look at Proverbs um, chapter 1. Um, let me turn there myself. Look at Proverbs chapter 1. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. You know, th this says a few things here, but basically this, this means that, you know, a wise person can learn things. <laughs> I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's basically saying a wise person can learn things. Guess what? A fool has to learn things again and again and again. And I don't want to be that person. I want to take the reference points that I have. I'd actually like to learn, but the best kind of way to learn is to learn from other people's reference points. To take hard times that other people have gone through. But the sad thing is, is really we need to fight our own battles a lot of times to understand these things. But really the smart, the wisest person will learn from other people's mistakes. And especially at least they will learn from making one mistake. It's, it's the fool that has to learn things again and again 
and again in their life. So look, I want, I want to prove, I want to prove to God that those hard times, that those reference points that I have, that those are enough. And I can use those to keep me zealous in my life. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 10. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 10. I just have a couple more thoughts on how you can keep your zeal and the importance of keeping your zeal um, this evening. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 10. Look at verse number 16. This is, this is Jehu. This is Jehu. And he is out on a mission to clean house that God has given him. And he runs across Jonadab. And he says to Jonadab, and he says, he, he pulls him up in his chariot, and he gave him his hand, and he took him up into the chariot, and he's still on this mission, and he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. So he rode in the chariot, and he's like, come witness how zealous I am for God. Come witness the works that I'm doing. The point, the only point I want to make out of this is your zeal affects other people. Your zeal in this church, you think about your, your, your role in this church, every single person in the, and I am sure that most of you underestimate this. I'm sorry, I'm just going to throw that one out there. You underestimate how much your zeal affects others. Because guess what? One person comes in and they're, guess what? Good or bad, by the way. Good or bad. One person comes in and they're super excited and they're just like, Woo! I mean, I made one comment to Matt one time, just I don't know what, even what I said, and he's just like, all of a sudden, I'm just pumped up right now. But that is the effect. It's not just because I'm the pastor. The effect that one person who is zealous for the Lord can have on every... I mean, if one person comes in, if, if one person's having a bad day, another person comes in and is just like super excited. My wife made some comments. She's like, I hope I get a really good map today. I really want to go soul winning. It's like, that excited me. That excited me to go soul winning. Because look... Not every day you're going to feel like that. But your zeal affects others. And that is what Jehu was pointing out here. Turn back to Revelation chapter 2. Turn back to Revelation chapter 2. There's one more thing I want to point out about this. Look at Revelation chapter 2. And look back at verse number 2. So your zeal, look, your zeal, you have a lot more effect on people than you think. And guess what? especially in, in a smaller group like this. You know, the zeal of one person goes a long way in, in a small church like ours. Look at verse number 2 of Revelation chapter 2. The Bible says, I know thy works and thy labor. Actually, you turn to Romans 5, and I'm going to read for you um, verse 2 and verse 3 again. I know thy works and thy labor. Turn to Romans 5. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. Twice he uses this word patience. Again in verse number three, and has, and has born and hast patience. And for my name's sake has labored. So twice he uses these two words, labor, we talked about that, and patience. Why is that? Go to Romans chapter five. Go to Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five, and look at verse number three. Romans chapter five in verse number three. So these people, they had a lot of patience. You know what that tells me? It tells me they had some trouble. It tells me they had some trouble in their church. And you can see the trouble as they're just kicking out all these false prophets. They got these Nicolaitans in there causing trouble. I mean, they're probably getting persecuted from other people. And, and look, these people had trouble. Because how do I know that? Because that's where they got the patience. Look at verse number three of Romans chapter five. The Bible says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. This is Paul, right? You should glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh, because out of tribulation comes patience. So tribulations, hard times, uh, suffering, produces patience in you. Did you know that? And patience, so this is just a, a great, beautiful pattern of what happens and how things progress from suffering from hard times, from those reference points. It says, from those hard times comes patience. And that's what the people in the church of Ephesus had. But then you get experience. And experience, because guess what? You know where experience comes from? What are, the, what are the two things that they said in Revelation chapter 2? This correlates perfectly with Romans. They, they had labor and they had patience. Guess what experience is? 
is continuing to labor, even through tribulation. So these people, they were gaining patience, and then they were gaining experience as they continued to labor. So what did Jesus tell them to do? He's like, get back to the first works. He's like, get back to the right works. He's like, get back to the correct works. Get the zeal back for those works. And then you will end up with what? In verse number four. What's the last word? Hope is what you will end up with. So here's what you do. You go through hard times and suffering, and you just keep pushing through it. You're going to gain patience there. You keep working through it. You keep your eyes focused on the first works. You keep your eyes focused on the spiritual things, and you continue to labor in those first works in those spiritual things. Look, fake it till you make it if you have to. And then guess what will pop out of that? Hope will come out of that. You know what? Hope equals zeal. And you will get your zeal back. That is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, he's like, you guys are hard workers. You guys are hard workers. He's like, you already have patience. But you've gone, because you've gone through so much garbage, you already have the patience. He's like, just get back to the first works that you're supposed to be doing, and you will get that zeal back, is what Jesus is saying. And it matches perfectly what Romans 5 says. What, and look, that suffering, and let's, let's remember the suffering so we don't have to go through the suffering to keep working, to keep getting our hope and our zeal back. Fake it till you make it. There's nothing wrong with that. But look, if you're just faking it all the time, there is something wrong there. So tribulation works patience, patience, experience, and experience, hope, or zeal. So if you're losing your zeal, don't take things for granted in your life. You know, remember, make reference points in your life. Appreciate the things in your life. And, you know, imagine the things, it's basically just imagine the things in your life that you say that you appreciate the most and just imagine that they're not there anymore. That would be a good reference point for you because there's no guarantee, folks, that these things are always going to be there. And then just keep working. Keep doing those first works, and that hope will return to you. And look, the, the zeal that is the end game here is so important that we never lose individually and especially as a church. We need to be a zealous church. There is super exciting things to be happening here. I mean, look, this, this church and churches like ours, we are, we are the, the explosion of Christianity in this country. You know, everyone's like, we need revival. Look, we are the revival. Our zeal is the revival. And that is what, that is what we always need to have as a church, and this is what Jesus is getting at. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.